energy is. And uh, that's uh, that was three years ago. This is this is uh, recently. Um, and, and Connor's no longer so fat as he was. <laughs> <laughs> now, never, this um, you know um, you can ask the question. A well-educated person can ask the question: Why should we be concerned about this? There have been much larger climate changes in the Earth's history. Uh, there have been huge changes, and it's arrogant to think that we can control the climate, or that we know enough to say that today's climate is the best one for the planet. Uh, this was a statement made on National Public Radio by my boss's boss's boss, the NASA administrator. And so it is a, a question, a, a reasonable question that a, a well-educated person can ask, and it's true that it the climate has had much lar very large changes in the Earth's history. Those changes actually tell us a lot that's relevant. Our understanding is based especially on uh, the Earth's history. We learn more from that than we do from climate models, for example, because we never know for sure if we've got all the physics in the models right. Um, but also, just looking at what's happening today with the climate forces that we're putting on the system is also very useful. But to start with the Earth's history, the, um, this is the temperature um, at uh, near the South Pole, which uh, fluctuates, this is over the last 400,000 years, and we get this temperature by drilling a core in the ice sheet. The Antarctic ice sheet is formed by snowfall piling up year after year. And so you can sample the snow that was laid down at different dates. And from the isotopic composition of the snow, you can tell what the temperature was when the snowflake formed. And we've been living in this Holocene, this warm period, for about uh, 10,000 years. 20,000 years ago, we were in the middle of the last ice age, when there was an ice sheet that covered Canada and covered New York and Minneapolis and Seattle. Um, but the Earth's climate fluctuates between warm periods and then gradually goes into these ice ages. And these fluctuations are associated with small changes in the Earth's orbit. The Earth's orbit is not perfectly circular, it's elliptical, but the ellipticity changes on a time scale of 100,000 years. And the date at which the Earth is closest to the Sun in that elliptical orbit changes with about a 20,000 year periodicity. And the tilt of the Earth's spin axis. It's the Earth's spin axis is tilted by 23 and a half degrees to the plane of the Earth's orbit, and that's what gives us the seasons. But that tilt fluctuates uh, by plus or minus one degree. And that's those small changes in the distribution of sunlight on the planet uh, change the climate, mainly by, for example, as the tilt becomes bigger, then there's more sunlight at the poles, and that will tend to melt the high-latitude ice sheets. And as the ice sheets melt, and you get this positive feedback or darker surface, and the planet gets a little bit warmer, when it gets a little bit warmer, CO2 will come out of the ocean, just like it comes out of your um, Pepsi if it gets warm. Um, so that induces more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So, um, and this is what we see when the planet is, is warm, then you've got more CO2 in the atmosphere and, and more methane, and this is the temperature down here. Um, well, we can use this, we can compare this present interglacial period, the Holocene, with the last ice age to estimate how sensitive the climate system is to climate forcing, which, as I say, is a perturbation of the planet's energy balance. Because the things that kept the planet colder during the ice age have to be either energy coming in, but we know that on that short a time scale, the sun's brightness doesn't change significantly, or something in the atmosphere or something on the surface. Well, we know the changes in the atmosphere because in this same ice core, there, we can sample the bubbles of air that existed at each point in time over the last 400,000 years. So we can tell how much, well, I showed you already the graph for how CO2 changed. Those greenhouse gases cause a forcing of about three watts per meter squared. But the increased, the changes on the Earth's surface 
mainly the larger areas of ice uh, caused a forcing of about three and a half watts per meter squared. So that implies a sensitivity of three quarters of a degree for each watt of forcing. Um, that's equivalent to three degrees Celsius for doubled carbon dioxide, because doubled carbon dioxide is four watts of forcing. And we can check that sensitivity for that entire 400,000 years because we have not only a record of how the greenhouse gases changed over that period, but we also have a record of sea level. And sea level changes a lot. Uh, sea level 20,000 years ago was 110 meters lower than it is now. But that water, which is not in the ocean, is in the ice sheets on the land. And so we, that's how we know how big the ice sheets were. And so we can calculate the forcing due to both the ice sheets and the greenhouse gases. And if we add those two up and multiply by three quarters of a degree, we get a calculated temperature which agrees very well with the observed uh, temperature. So it tells us how sensitive the uh, climate is. And, and now we just recently got an 800,000 year record from a longer ice core. And it, and it agrees very well in that time period also. And now the thing is that humans, I've expanded the time scale at the end just to show the modern uh, observations. And methane is increasing um, far off the chart. It, and CO2 is increasing far outside the range that has existed for millions of years. And that, of course, those increases are due to fossil fuel uh, use primarily, although there are also other sources of methane. And uh, one thing that uh, the contrarians point out and, and become very confused about is the fact that if you look very carefully at these variations of the greenhouse gases and the temperature, you see that the, uh, the temperature changed first. It slightly changes, it begins to change a bit and then the greenhouse gases increase, and then the temperature increases some more, and the greenhouse gases increase some more. It's a, it's a feedback on these time, and that's exactly what we expect, because the instigation for these swings is changes in the Earth's orbit. And the way they work is, as I explained, so of course the uh, temperature changes first, but then the greenhouse gas is half of the reason for the temperature change. The other half of the reason is the change in the surface albedo. And the instigating forcing, which is only a couple tenths of a watt per meter squared, is a very small fraction of the direct, of the ultimate cause of the temperature changes. And that shouldn't be so hard for the contrarians to understand. But nevertheless, um, in order to show you an example which is also very instructive, we can look at time scales on which greenhouse gases do change first, and the temperature responds uh, to that change. Uh, it, all we have to do is look at longer time scales. So what I've done here is, um, this is the temperature change uh, over the last 65 million years, which is called the Cenozoic Era. It follows uh, just after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, and the last three million years are blown up here to show you what it looks like on a higher resolution. And then the last uh, 400,000 years are blown up here, and that's the familiar Ice Age uh, cycle. And you can see that those Ice Ages uh, were occurring uh, at, at all times, but they're small, although those are huge changes. Uh, they're small in comparison to the total change that occurs from uh, the present back to, say, 50 million years ago. In fact, between 65 million years ago and 35 million years ago, there was no ice sheets on the planet. The planet was too warm to have ice. Uh, but uh, the, now the reason that CO2, that uh, the temperature changes on these long timescales, we know 